Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Zaidah. This evening's big story, no prizes for guessing, is Afghanistan where Kabul has fallen to the Taliban. Analyses are already piling up about what went wrong. Lots did, and we can be sure to see, see this genre getting fatter in the days, weeks, and months to come. To be fair, there were many discerning voices in the two decades. The U.S. was in Afghanistan warning of failure that inhered in Project Afghanistan. No one listened, and those who did couldn't do much about it. Bureaucratic path dependence, political expediencies, interactive complexity, the inability to move from traditional military practice of using force for a political solution to understanding whether the political solution sought was in line with the socio-cultural and economic and other factors that informed an ethnically fractured polity at war for decades. All of this and much more manifested itself in what the world has witnessed in the past month. It's easy to take a snapshot view of Kabul's fall and feel surprised or frustrated. It's far more difficult to take a longitudinal view of that failure. And though it is rewarding, unfortunately, it doesn't much change anything on the ground. The world is simply trying to close the stable door after the horse has bolted. But let's get to our panel this evening and try to answer just one question. How and why did the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces folded before the Taliban? To be sure, this is not a question. Equally, it cannot be seen in isolation from many other factors. But given the allotted time, we'll have to be parsimonious. I'm joined by Jason Dempsey, a former lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army who served in Afghanistan and is currently a junk senior fellow at the Center of a New American Security, Dr. Gordon Adams. Dr. Adams is Professor Emeritus at American University's School of International Service, and Dr. Kamran Bukhari, Director of Analytical Development at the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy. Let's begin with Colonel Dempsey here. Colonel Dempsey, I was going through a, a book review that you did for uh, one of the, uh, the websites. And this is Morgan's and Colenda's books that you're talking about. And you said that you talked about political and cultural blindness. And you talked about the fact that despite official statements from the US military, putting together effective Afghan security forces were never taken seriously by the US military. And you also said that by trying to create Afghan forces that were a mirror image of the US military, the United States designed a national army for its own country, not Afghanistan. So give us a sense of why that was so, and along the line, uh, why didn't anyone think that that was not the way to go about it? Um. You were asking, I only caught a little bit on the question about the uh, um, the book review. What I would say is what America is grappling with now um, and where we are, where the military has to look internally um, was very much we approached uh, Afghanistan looking for the best answer instead of the answer that was possible. Right. So when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, the initial project seemed to be counterterrorism. It was to uh, uproot Al-Qaeda, also to go for the Taliban. Uh, at that point, uh, there were people who said, uh, you, sh you know, the, the United States and its allies should involve the Taliban in the bond process or in any political process. But that was something that uh, the U.S. administration at that time, including the uh, Secretary of Defense, the late Donald Rumsfeld, thought was simply not going to happen. Um, and, and so uh, the Taliban were shunned, uh, they were captured, they were sent to Guantanamo, and so on. Um, and then the U.S. counterterrorism strategy also uh, created a lot of chaos on the ground, uh, not realizing the tribal affiliations and other, other structural and cultural reasons for which People uh, would retaliate. They were, they were hunkered down. They're biding their time. But when the Taliban regrouped, this is the population that uh, that they found found the recruitment from. You know, when you talk talk about how we conflated Al Qaeda with that, with the Taliban, is it's reflective of uh, our inability or our unwillingness to look for nuance 
in who was a threat to American interests and who wasn't. Uh, and so shortly after the war, uh, war started, there was this widespread belief, um, you know, the with us or against us phrase that uh, George Bush used at one point uh, to kind of split the world into pure black or pure white and that we would be able to deal with anybody that we put in the category of being an enemy. Uh, and our our lack of fidelity or our lack of refinement on that uh, and just our anger over 9-11 that anybody could host Al-Qaeda uh, led us to believe that the Taliban was just as bad. Right? We never differentiated between those two. Uh, and that was probably one of the fundamental flaws of the war was not realizing uh, that you could not simply declare the Taliban, one, they weren't an enemy, and two, declaring them an enemy uh, that you could resoundingly defeat in Afghanistan uh, was one of our biggest mistakes. Okay, so uh, let's get to some specifics. What would you say uh, was the reason for the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces to fall before the Taliban with the, the speed which has actually surprised everyone, and, and I, I believe also the Taliban themselves. Yeah, and I think what it showed was the, the, the fragility of the whole system that we set up. Um, and we in the American military rolled into Afghanistan, um, and we didn't want to deal with the politics. Despite everything we said and everything you may have heard uh, American military leaders talk about counterinsurgency, uh, we said for years that the most important thing to do is stand up the Afghan military. Uh, but we took the easy way out in doing so. What we tried to do, the easiest thing we could do was set up a military that looked like ours. Uh, and so we set up a military that assumed um, that there was really no sectarian conflict, no corruption, um, a good education system, uh, and you had a population that was ready, willing, and able to fight for a legitimate central government. And it's that last bit that's a real key. Okay? So what we did is we tried to create a national army uh, on a template for a nation that didn't exist in the form that we created that military for. And so at the end of the day, uh, you know, if you are a young Afghan out in the periphery, if you're down in Paktia, you're in Gardez, you're in Host, uh, you, have legitimate concerns about whether or not there's a government behind you that's willing to fight and sacrifice with you, or is it the same government, the same chain of command that hasn't been paying you for years? Um, you know, we, we really created uh, a paper tiger. Um, you know, the American military was propping up the Afghan army uh, with air support and fire support for so many years that we convinced ourselves uh, that it was their capability being displayed and not ours. Okay, so for many years, they also fought alongside, uh, perhaps in a supporting role, fought alongside the U.S. military and, and its allies. What exactly was their performance on the ground? Uh, for many elements, it was great. Um, you know, a lot of the units I work with, there are a lot of great Afghans out there who really wanted to make a better country. Um, but we tried to create a massive bureaucracy from scratch. Uh, we tried to build an army that looked like ours. And the, the key for folks maybe not familiar is uh, the United States military is heavily reliant on very, very complex systems of resupply, coordination, uh, just a lot of things that, for instance, you don't see the Taliban using or needing. The Taliban are storming across the country with cell phones, maybe some walkie-talkies, uh, and a bunch of old AK-47s. You know, now, obviously, they have a lot of our equipment. But prior to that, they didn't have these things. What they had was political legitimacy and units that kind of grew up slowly and organically versus, try, versus a top-down process where we tried to build these massive formations that often we struggled to even do the basics with, like pay. Um, so as my, you know, as people talk about and people question the performance of the Afghan military, what I want to make clear is, is their quick collapse is not at all a reflection of the individual heroism and the dedication of a lot of those men uh, to the future of Afghanistan. Okay, final question. 
there's a lot of talk about corruption, about ghost platoons and, and companies, uh, people pocketing money, uh, and some of the cigar reports and other reports mentioned that there were people uh, within the US government, especially uh, in the Department of Defense, who were fairly clear about what was going on, but not much was done to stem that. So give us a sense of why that was so. And that's, it's always confounded me a bit. It's the one thing that we always wanted to ignore. I will tell you that there is not a single U.S. military officer that went through Afghanistan uh, and did not see and understand that there was a lot of corruption. Uh, but it was easier for us to ignore it. Um, and I would say that part of the issue here is the way we structured our military is we only rotated through on seven, nine, or 12-month increments. If you're trying to root out a corrupt system, that's barely enough time to understand that the problem is even there, let alone begin to address it. Uh, and so it was much easier for every American commander that rotated through, uh, once they understood that many of their Afghan counterparts had separate business lines on the side or using their positions for personal enrichment, uh, we would turn a blind eye for anybody who is aggressive against the Taliban uh, or who just ignore the problem altogether uh, because it was just so much easier to say, well, these guys are corrupt, but if we keep taking the fight and we defeat the Taliban, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, and maybe somebody somewhere will come along and fix it. Um, you know, we did have a whole entire anti-corruption task force one year that clearly had zero effect. Um, and a lot of it is just because we are simply uninterested in the nuance. And the last comment I would make on that is uh, we were not interested enough even to understand the difference between corruption and patronage. Um, you know, there's petty corruption, but then there's also these networks of patronage that have kept many Afghans alive for decades. Uh, and in our clumsiness, instead of accounting for and working around existing patronage networks, we either just wanted to clamp down on all corruption or just ignore the problem altogether. So yes, it existed. Yes, the military knew it was there, uh, but we completely ignored it and pretended it didn't exist. All right. Thank you so much, Colonel Jason Dempsey speaking with us. Uh, Professor Adams, it's quite clear that uh, there were structural problems uh, that inhered in the very uh, manner in which the United States went about creating first the provisional government, then, you know, providing a constitution, creating the military, et cetera, et cetera. Now, hindsight is 2020, but there were people, as I said in my opening, who were fairly clear about what was wrong and were also pointing it out. So give me your sense of how you look at this Kabul's fall, uh, how the NDSF folded, and, and the overall U.S. project Afghanistan. Uh, well, I can't imagine a better metaphor for uh, what is happening in Kabul right now uh, than Vietnam. People have not been uh, prepared in this country, in the United States, to acknowledge uh, that uh, we have done it again. Um, done it again here, done it again in Iraq, did it before in Vietnam. Uh, our capacity, and I think some of what Colonel Dempsey was saying reflects this, our capacity to fool ourselves about another country and our ability to have an impact on the politics, economics, uh, society, military operations of another country, our capacity to have an impact on those things is vastly more limited and, frankly, our knowledge of the details of the sophistication and the complexity of another society uh, is sorely lacking. It was lacking in Vietnam, and I was around for Vietnam. It was lacking when we invaded Iraq and didn't understand Sunni versus Shia. It was lacking in Afghanistan when we did not understand the nature of what Colonel Dempsey correctly called patronage, and I would say tribal relationships and ethnic differences uh, and militia organizations, military organizations that already existed in Afghanistan. We kind of walked in like an innocent abroad into this situation and then tried to restructure it. So the biggest mistake was made right at the very beginning, uh, which was to assume once uh, the, the Taliban had been chased from Kabul and chased out of government 
And once uh, the uh, Al Qaeda camps had been wiped out, although Osama bin Laden slipped away, uh, we decided in the United States that the way to guarantee the future here was to expand the mission. And to expand the mission meant rebuilding an entirely different national infrastructure for the army, for the military in Afghanistan, rebuilding the government in Afghanistan, invading, uh, I investing in economic development and what was called reconstruction in Afghanistan. And these were all missions impossible. Uh, they were a disaster from the very start because we were ignoring the history of Afghanistan, the social structure of Afghanistan, the economic architecture of Afghanistan, the importance of the drug trade in Afghanistan. All of these things we just papered over and tried to make go away. And as, as I think uh, Colonel Dempsey was saying, we then started reproducing almost cookie cutter fashion things that we would do in the United States, whether it was local or provincial governments, uh, whether it was economic investment projects, uh, whether it was a, a national military architecture. Almost everything from the beginning was based on the presumption that we were going to remake a society. And frankly, the United States has now ample experience of failure at trying to remake other societies. Uh, keeping the goal small, allowing the architecture of the country as it then existed to coalesce around something other than the Taliban right back at the beginning should have been the strategy. And I, I, you know, I can't be here and sit, sit here and say, I told you so, except I told you so. And as some people did say, this is not, nation building is not the exercise that needs to be undertaken here. Evicting the Taliban and allowing the Afghanis, Afghani people to settle their societal arrangements in their own way were in the best American national interest. So we, we kicked the ball way beyond the goalposts here, and it ended up in the stands uh, with a failure of policy. Absolutely. Um, uh, that's very uh, perspicacious. Uh, it's just that uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, told ABCs this week, this is manifestly not Saigon. We went into Afghanistan 20 years ago with one mission in mind, and that was to deal with the people who attacked us on 9-11, and that mission has been successful. I quite doubt the, the success of that mission also, and as uh, Professor Adams uh, said, uh, the, the project kind of expanded itself into areas that uh, were beyond uh, the capacity of the United States, or for that matter, a number of you know, the entire conglomerate, uh, which was the US and its allies, let me pull in Dr. Kamran Bukhari into this. Kamran, so give me your sense of, you heard Colonel Dempsey uh, talk about the ANDSF um, and, and the reasons for why uh, it failed so badly. Uh, give me your sense of what you think went wrong with that project. I agree with uh, Colonel Dempsey and, and, and Professor Adams. They, they in quite detail explained the basic fundamental problems. Uh, look, bottom line is that the United States is not capable of uh, nation building. Uh, the United States, and this doesn't only apply to Afghanistan, look what happened in Iraq. Uh, so we have a situation where the United States can go in. Regime collapse is easy. Regime change in you know the, the the old phrase of regime change from the early 2000s um, is an impossibility because you're assuming you can put Humpty Dumpty back together and that's not the case um, uh, the, um, the state in Afghanistan uh, was completely shattered when 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 the US came in uh, the Taliban had what would be called a bit more sophisticated version of what Isis had in Iraq and, and uh, Syria, the, the, the so-called caliphate, although the Taliban believe in emirates. Uh, but the bottom line is that they had, uh, there was no state, there was no infrastructure, and the United States had to build that from scratch. And building that from scratch presupposes that A, you have the architecture to do that, you have the science to do that, and B, that the, the local partners that you're dealing with are quite capable of absorbing what you're giving them. And that, I think, is the fundamental reason why the ANDSF really collapsed. Because at the end of the day, 
uh, they, these people were originally militiamen. And turning a militia into a state security organization uh, requires a lot of hard work, and it doesn't happen even in 20 years. And then the United States approached this with one hand or one arm of its own tied behind its back, and then the, uh, the diversion to Iraq. You know, within a year of the bond process, the United States had effected regime change in Iraq. In other words, the bulk of U.S. forces were deployed elsewhere, and this became like a part-time job that time sort of muddled along, uh, and, I mean, on top of the idea, uh, on top of the reality that uh, this, uh, uh, the, the United States mission was never clear. So first it was, let's destroy Al-Qaeda, disrupt its ability to carry follow-on attacks, uh, and then that somehow requ that required toppling the Taliban regime. But toppling the Taliban regime then meant that you had to put a new one in its place. And that new one never took off. And for many, many years, we thought that we were building a regime uh, that would be durable, at least pro uh, provide for a counterweight to the Taliban. Uh, no one was expecting that there was going to be a robust Afghan state, far from it. But, it, but what happened in the last uh, seven to eight days is stunning because uh, it almost looked like a house of cards that was collapsing even after 20 years, a uh, trillion dollars plus, and thousands of precious lives lost. But, but you see, uh, uh, you know, uh, Walter Ladwig III uh, wrote this uh, 2017 book, The Forgotten Front, which is about the patron-client relationships and counterinsurgency, which talks about the fact that, you, you know, when you have this kind of uh, a relationship, uh, your client uh, is likely to have its own uh, uh, sort of, you know, interests, its own, uh, you know, uh, uh, how should I put it, uh, you know, the influence, the, 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 the idea of how to go about it. Uh, in this case, of course, the, the, the corruption um, and various other things that, that happened uh, under that uh, sort of, you know, umbrella uh, uh, concept of building the Afghan army and, you know, sustaining it and training it and the rest of it. So I think, uh, you know, there were case studies, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's, you know, elsewhere. Uh, things should have been clear. Uh, and as I said, there were people uh, who were warning of where it was going. Yeah, absolutely. Look, you know, it should have been clear. But it, it, here, here's the thing. It, it takes a long time from something to be done scientifically, academically, even for a policy paper to be operationalized. Uh, I mean, forget about operationalizing. Accepting. Uh, you know, gain acceptance in government circles and say, okay, this seems like sound advice and we should follow it. So I, I think that there is a disconnect between uh, the, the policy intellectual community and, you know, the practitioners uh, in, in, in Washington as far as this was concerned. Uh, yes, there was enough collective wisdom out there that, I mean, this is the same argument. There was enough intelligence prior to 9-11 that al-Qaeda was going to attack the United States. But it was spread across the various uh, agencies of the United States uh, yeah, you know, yeah, security but, system. But, 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 Kamran, was but this, was a, this was a trajectory spread over 20 years, and, and I think uh, that was enough time uh, for people to have realized that it's not going to go anywhere in the way that it's been conceived and operationalized. Uh, but unfortunately, I've run out of time, so thank you so much to uh, Dr. Gordon Adams, to Dr. Kamran Bukhari for their insights. We shall take a short break and return to continue with our discussion of the situation in Afghanistan. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. We continue our discussion of the situation in Afghanistan, where Kabul fell to Taliban forces with a speed that has surprised everyone, everyone, including the Taliban themselves. 
In that backdrop, we now get to the challenges Pakistan faces in view of the evolving situation. I'm joined by Dr. Rifat Hussain, Head Department of Policy at the National University of Science and Technology, Ambassador Asif Durrani, a former diplomat who served as Pakistan's ambassador to Iran, and Zaid Hussain, eminent journalist and author most recently of No When War, The Paradox of U.S.-Pakistan Relations in Afghanistan's Shadow. But before we get to that, the latest is that uh, earlier China urged the Taliban to keep its promise and ensure a smooth transition as Beijing figures out its strategy in the neighboring country following the U.S.'s hasty departure. And so uh, this is uh, what one of the spokespersons said. China welcomes the Taliban's promise that they will allow no force to use the Afghan territory to engage in acts detrimental to China and its, and its expression of hope that China will be more involved in Afghanistan's peace and reconciliation process and play a bigger role in future reconstruction and economic development. So that's as far as China is concerned. Uh, earlier, the uh, Russian ambassador also met with the, with the Taliban uh, uh, elements, their leaders in Kabul. So that's there also. Uh, and now let's get to uh, where we stand and how we need to uh, figure this out. So, Dr. Hussain. The biggest challenge that Pakistan has to face is, uh, is going to be a diplomatic challenge. Not only the issue of recognition of the Taliban government, now they have, they have gotten control of, the, uh, of Kabul, is going to be uh, a, a, a major challenge for us. But dealing with the nitty-gritty border management, uh, they would like to uh, keep the Pakistani border open for traffic because of the internal pressures. And the larger issue is going to be how Pakistan is going to deal with the Taliban, with whom Pakistan over the past 20 years, as a, as a result of its participation in the global war on terror, has not taken too kindly and has been urging them to, uh, to talk about peace and inclusive peace. But that inclusive peace is now uh, gone forever. The hopes for inclusive peace are, uh, are gone, with the, gone with the wind, as it, as it were. And, and Pakistan has to now uh, uh, learn to live with the reality of the Taliban. So Taliban are going to be in the driving seat and Pakistan can only be at but, the receiving but, uh, Dr. end, Sam, at there least is, that's my assessment. Dr. San, there's also another argument, and I think uh, it has a lot of weight, and let me take that to Zahid Hussain. Uh, so Zahid Hussain, uh, in the Northeast and the Northwest, uh, the Taliban went in, they, they controlled the area, uh, but that balance is tenuous. Uh, and these are, uh, you know, two big ethnic groups, heavy Tajik areas in the Northeast, heavy Uzbek areas in the Northwest, and so, Unless the Taliban, and that's what Sohail Shaheen also said in one of the interviews, that we don't want to go for a centralized old formula that hasn't worked. So in order for this balance to remain and for the Taliban to stabilize, uh, it seems to me that they will have to be amenable, or at least strategically amenable, to having people from other eth ethnic groups uh, to become part of whatever the next power sharing setup is going to be yes, i think for challenge for taliban uh, is much easier now because it was easier for them relatively speaking easier to uh, for them to take control of uh, afghanistan because they have been fighting for last few, uh, 20 years and in fact actually before, even before doha agreement was signed with, uh, with the united states they already had about uh, can, can, uh, to some extent influence over 50% of afghanistan so now that uh, obviously everybody was shocked and surprised by the by the rapidity of their takeover. But uh, I think uh, if you could see, it, it all happened, not just because of their military power, because they have been dealing with other warlords, particularly in northern Afghanistan. That made Correct. them very, made it very easy for them to take control of those areas, which in fact, actually traditionally has never been their stronghold. Uh, so saying all that, I mean, like, um, and, and taking over Kabul so easily without any 
um, any resistance. Actually, that made a point, certain point for Taliban that they are not have not taken over Afghanistan through brute force. So it may have some validity. But basically, now coming back to uh, to Taliban, uh, it is e easy. It's always easier to take control of of a country. But to run a country is a very different. Uh, yeah, that's game. that's that's think, the most important. That's the most important point, and I I think that's where the United States and its allies also failed completely. So let me uh, quickly take that to Ambassador Dini. Ambassador Durrani, what we have seen on the ground is, of course, the ANDSF folding, but in many areas, in many districts, this happened because the Taliban were uh, in, in contact with the, with the elders and the local influential people, cut deals with them, and those, those people said, okay, in order to avoid violence, uh, we'll let you in, and, and so at least 90% of the territory that they, they have captured has been captured not through brute force and fighting, but through deals. Given that, and this is not new, they did this in the 90s also. Given that, uh, what is your assessment of how they are going to go about it and uh, what challenges Pakistan faces? Or let me reformulate it. What role can Pakistan play uh, in, in, in terms of influencing any outcomes in Afghanistan, if at all? Ajaz, I think uh, now the, the, the Taliban in 2021 are uh, quite different than what we had uh, 20 years ago. Uh, they are politically, I think, more savvy and more mature than uh, two decades ago. And uh, the reason is that uh, look at the coordination council they have formed in which uh, Hamid Karzai, Hikmat uh, and uh, Abdullah Abdullah are part of it. And then uh, they have also uh, approached uh, many other warlords as well as tribal elders, as rightly pointed out by you. Uh, this is the Afghan way or tribal way of uh, reaching out uh, to the people. And then they have also been sending out messages to uh, ethnic and uh, religious minorities about uh, owing allegiance to the Taliban, although it was not taken lightly by the Hazaras initially. But now uh, they have also made a Hazara governor in the Hazarajat province. So this is something uh, which is quite unusual. It was, uh, you would not witness it uh, prior to 9-11. So in this manner, uh, when you say what role Pakistan can play, I think Pakistan can play the role uh, in a sense in bringing all the ethnic groups together. And in they can, Pakistan can also encourage inclusiveness in the future dispensation, but Pakistan cannot dictate the terms. This uh, we have to be very clear because we are talking about Afghanistan. There, you cannot dictate terms. Uh, this has happened. Absolutely, in the past. and I, I don't think I don't think Pakistan intends to do that. But, but it does have a role to play, not just in terms of peace in Afghanistan, which is very important, but also because stability in Pakistan itself is uh, deeply connected with stability in Afghanistan. Uh, 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 Dr. Hussain, uh, would it be feasible, uh, you know, we were planning to have a conference in Islam, but that was quietly shelved because President Ashraf Ghani uh, objected to it. Uh, now, given what's happening, would it be, uh, you know, prudent on, on the part of Pakistan to actually host a conference, get the, the people, this, this coordination council and others, and make them sit together, and, and, you know, uh, where they can think about the, the way forward. Uh, would that be a gesture that would go down well with people in Afghanistan? Uh, Ijaz, uh, for me, the critical issue is that how much leverage Pakistan has over the emerging dispensation uh, uh, in Kabul. And my guess is leverage that Pakistan thinks it has over the over the over the over the Taliban, because as I said earlier, that the Taliban are now in the driving seat. So once they put together some sort of a uh, political dispensation or a uh, sort of an interim setup or a government, uh, and they have rejected the idea 
which was floated by Pakistani uh, Pakistan Prime Minister that if uh, you would have listened to me and if you would have gone for an interim setup, then the tragedy could have been avoided. But now that they are in the driving seat, so they are the ones who are going to call the shots. And there were underlying tensions uh, with, with, uh, with Islamabad over this whole issue of Pakistan's support for the global war on terror. And so the, the Taliban have a long memory. They may have uh, acted out of prudence and you know, send a message of assurance in, uh, to, uh, to neighboring countries, including Islamabad, but I don't think that they, uh, right now, at least for the next week or so, they would be in a mood to listen to what Pakistan has to say. And the and the uh, conference that we are put, uh, are we are trying to put together, that has uh, that uh, that has actually uh, has very little legitimacy because it it represented people uh, who do not uh, form the core of the Taliban thought process. Okay. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Rifat Hussain speaking with us very quickly. Um, Zaid Hussain, uh, the idea seems to be, yes, they are uh, the major group right now uh, in control of Afghanistan. But that control is, I, I'll insist once again, that control in many ways is tenuous. Ambassador Durrani just talked about having a Hazara as the governor in Hazara Jat. The Taliban are also in contact with Iran, and I think one of the reasons, uh, you know, uh, that their attitude and their their sort of you know approach to these issues have undergone a change is because they understand that if they were to go back to the 90s, then they'll not get the international recognition, they'll not get any funding for governance. They understand these issues. Do you think uh, that? you know, one can argue it this way or simply that, you know, it's the same bunch as some people say uh, that was uh, ruling Afghanistan in the 90s? Well, like, yeah, I think, um, yes, uh, they can't be they can't behave in the same way as they did in 1990. It was a very different situation altogether. Uh, uh, this is 2021, and Afghanistan has also changed tremendously uh, over the last uh, two decades. Uh, more Afghans have, have got education. They have access and exposure uh, to, the, to the modern world. So in a way, actually, Taliban have to change their worldview also. But the major question, so far, we what we are getting from the leadership is a very moderate voice, and there is indication that they would like to change. They have uh, promised uh, equal rights to, for everyone. Uh, they, they have promised uh, inclusive government, uh, and also actually right to women to work and other things. But the major issue is that um, what about the people on the ground, the commanders on the ground? For the last 20 years, most of them have been fighting for certain goal and certain objective. It was not just about uh, throwing out Americans, but also actually to establish the old Emirates. So if um, uh, so it will be a, a great challenge for the leadership, Taliban leadership, okay. to uh, to show any moderation because um, we have heard actually at, on uh, in various areas, despite Taliban's uh, proclamation that uh, nothing should be uh, uh, that girls should not be stopped from going to school, but there has been some incident in some areas where yes, the local uh, well, commanders those, have stopped them. And and apparently so at the at least the central leadership or, or the main leaders have also said that. Uh, those are issues they are looking into. But um, uh, let me, before I wrap up, uh, very quickly, Ambassador Durrani, uh, what is your sense of how the Taliban are going to uh, be different from the 90s now in 2021? One, they have become more savvy. Secondly, Afghanistan itself has changed a lot. Third, that governance issues and international recognition are very important issues. And unless they play ball, on the basis of certain basic international norms that they understand that's going to be difficult to acquire. So is, is, is that an optimistic scenario or do you think that's uh, you know, realistic and one, one can expect them to behave that way? I think uh, Taliban uh, have realized that they are not an island and they are not living an island. So they have to live uh, with other nations and their recognition is very important. 
And uh, that is uh, one of the conditions also now, not only from the United States, but the West, as well as other neighbors of Afghanistan. But uh, the, the, uh, the, the tangible change which you now witness is that now Taliban have the recognition within the immediate neighborhood, Iran, uh, China, and uh, Uzbekistan, I mean, these stands. So this is a very, you know, very, you can say, a positive change, and which also, in fact, uh, convinced the Americans that now the time has come to withdraw. And that's how that when you see that both Taliban and Americans, they are not talking against each other. Right. If you look at it, and it looks as if there is a tangible uh, understanding from the Americans that they would allow the Taliban to rule. Yes. Happily. Thank you so much. That was uh, uh, Ambassador Asif Durrani. Thank you also to Zaid Hussain for his insights. This is all from and focus this evening. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.